This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. So I'm John Powell. I'm talking to you from the Prime Meridian in England, 51 degrees north. And uh, I'm going to talk about water as a commons in England. And Evaristo, do you want to introduce yourself? Okay, I'm Evaristo Mapeto, uh, based in Ghana with the International Water Management Institute. So we're going to start with um, looking at water in England. And the big question uh, we're currently asking is, is it a commodity or a commons resource or is it both? So if we move on to a couple of slides, um, here's just a view of uh, some people working on an irrigation system in Ghana. And to give you a bit of a contrast, so that's Ghana down uh, near the equator. And the next slide will show us um, the River Thames in London. So we've got quite a contrast in uh, the kind of situation we're, we're both in um, a long way apart. Right, so talking about England, if you want to move to the next slide. Water in the UK. Obviously, we're not short of water in the UK. What I'm going to talk about um, is water consumption, a uh, little bit about the water industry, more about the governance structure, spend a couple of minutes on current issues and what we're looking at into the future. This, uh, one of the things that has happened recently over the, in the UK is the major improvement in water quality the environmental water quality, although we've still got a long way to go. So the essential element, water, absolutely essential for life. Um, this picture is uh, taken in the pump room in Cheltenham. And Cheltenham, the whole of the town of Cheltenham I live in, it was built on the basis of medicinal water. Uh, back in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, there was a lot of disease outbreaks. People were sharing wells. We had cholera epidemics. And people would flood to the spas where there was guaranteed to be quality water, which was said to improve all kinds of, uh, cure all kinds of ailments. But of course, it was mainly the royalty, the aristocrats, and the rich that could benefit from that. Clean water was just as valuable then as it is now. But we've got a long history in this country, going back to the 17th century, of private water companies delivering clean water to households. Of course, it was very expensive, um, you know, 100, 200 years ago. It cost about 10% uh, of an annual wage for a laborer to have water to deliver to your house at the beginning of the 19th century. The price has come down enormously, and today in the UK, the average cost for clean water to deliver to, to your house is about one pound a day. All right, let's go to the next slide. So the characteristics of water in the UK are the multiple uses, the high demands from a whole range of different um, uses, industrial uses. About uh, up until recently, approximately half the water consumption in the UK was used by the electricity generating sector. Um, in order to uh, provide steam for turbines to generate electricity and for cooling. Agriculture has not been such a large user, although crop irrigation is now increasing in this country. Uh, but also there are heavy demands for navigation and uh, for recreation, particularly for fishing and boating on inland waters. Consumption is about 150 litres per person per day in the UK, but if we look at the water footprint, that is the amount of water used by a person in terms of all the things they consume in a day, it's estimated that our daily consumption per person is over 4,000 litres. So the UK is a massive importer of water. Basically, we're a small country uh, with short, fast-flowing rivers. If you just move to the next slide. Uh, there's a cooling towers um, on the River Trent, drawing enormous amounts of water out of the Trent in order to cool down um, 
steam from the electricity generating station there. And the next slide shows you uh, a map there of uh, the UK, or most of the, sorry, it's mostly England and Wales. Uh, but we essentially have short rivers, very fast runoff, uh, and what keeps us supplied with water, of course, is endless amounts of rain. Uh, we are heavily reliant also on groundwater for supplying water. But we've had a drought this year. This summer was a heavy drought. We had a really serious drought in 1976. Uh, and one big uncertainty is uh, the impacts of climate change on our water consumption. Okay, next slide. So just a few photographs um, to give you an idea of what it looks like in this area. This is one of the, this is the longest river in England, the River Severn. Uh, this is the River Severn at Tewkesbury just a few days ago. Uh, it's uh, heavily used for, as you can see there, for fishing, for recreation, uh, but also it's a major water supplier for agriculture, uh, for water consumption, for water supply, and for industry. Uh, if you just go to the next slide. Uh, this is a water treatment plant. This dates back to the early part of the 20th century. Uh, a lot of water, a lot of towns along the river are taking water out for household and industrial supplies. And the next slide. Uh, and this actually is a piece of common land uh, in front of Tewkesbury Abbey. Uh, it's called the Ham. It's surrounded by the River Severn. It's, it's a water meadow. It gets flooded every year. Uh, during springtime and uh, the rest of the time it's grazed as a common. Next slide. So the big question is, what is water? It has been called an uncooperative commodity and an imperfect public good. But if we just look at this diagram, which is uh, a way of deciding where, what kind of goods um, the characteristics of particular goods based on whether they're subtractable, that is if one person consumes it, then it's not available for somebody else, and how easy or difficult it is to exclude somebody from the resource, then water does not seem to fit very well into um, this particular graphic. Uh, up in the top right hand corner, we have public goods. These are goods where it's difficult to exclude people from using them or accessing them and one person's use uh, does not affect another person's use of the good. So if you think of things like rivers and lakes, uh, it's difficult to stop people accessing them for navigation for example and the fact that somebody's navigating on the river doesn't stop somebody else from navigating on the river. Uh, so thinking of the sort of the of water in the natural environment, it it looks like a, it, has, it has the characteristics of a public good. Rivers, lakes, aquatic ecosystems, the ecological quality of water are all valuable public goods. In the opposite quadrant, the lower left quadrant, you can think of drinking water as more of a private good. It's highly subtractable. If I drink a glass of water, then that's not available for somebody else to use. And because you're taking water and putting it into a distribution system, you're taking it from the ground or a lake or a reservoir, it's actually quite easy to exclude people. So it's more, it has more of the characteristics of a public good. But we can think of things like bottled water, um, drinking water, and even sewage treatment, which is sort of the other end of the uh, system when you've used your water and you're putting it down the, uh, the pipe to get rid of it. Uh, they can all be easily managed as private goods and people can be charged a fee for using those. But also, you know, some rivers and lakes, if they get crowded, uh, if fishing areas get crowded, if there's too many people trying to fish, then rather than a public good, uh, those environmental waters take on the nature of a commons resource, where it's actually still difficult to exclude people but the fact that somebody's taking fish out of the river uh, prevents somebody else from taking those fish. So it also has some characteristics of a commons. And of course, um, fishing rights, specialized water sports can also be delivered in terms of club goods. 
And certainly in this country, there are clubs, organizations that buy up fishing rights for their members only. So what is water, a commons or a commodity? Well, it has characteristics of both of those. It can be a commodity and it can also be a commons and the public good. So if we go move to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the governance of water in the UK. As I said at the beginning, we have had a very long uh, history of privatization of water, of water. As far back as the 1600s, private companies were delivering water to households in London and other big cities. Then during the 19th century, um, government got involved because of the industrialization and urbanization of the country and local authorities were the main providers of water. But we ended up with over a thousand local authority districts and over 1,400 private water companies delivering water. So there was no, over, there was no oversight, um, there was no control over what companies were doing. So in the late 1980s, um, the government decided to privatize the water supply industry. So drinking water and sewage became privatized. Oh, sorry, not just drinking water, but any, any water used for industrial use uh, or agriculture or uh, any, any kind of consumption became privatized. This was also largely because of a lack of government investment in the water supply, in the water industry. We ended up with nine large regional water suppliers and 21 private water companies across the whole country. But that also meant um, because essentially the water companies, because of the way water has to be stored, distributed, uh, and then treated, um, they were essentially the, 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 these companies were monopolies. So in order to control the, the, these monopolies and to prevent huge price increases and uh, monopoly, not monopoly profits, the government also had to set up a, uh, an office of water management to oversee the pricing to ensure that the private sector was able to benefit in, the ter in terms of, um, of profit, but also to ensure that people were not charged too much and that the private sector invested for the long term. And in addition to that, there was a drinking water inspectorate to ensure that water quality maintained, uh, was maintained at a high level. In terms of environmental water quality, the, the quality of water in the rivers and lakes, that was regulated by the public sector and still is. We have an organization called the Environmental Protection Agency, which manages water quality in the environment. And also um, is the main body for um, people who want to use water, anybody who wants to take water out of the ground or out of a surface body has to get an abstraction license. Uh, however, our whole system of governance is now regulated through European Union regulations. And the main piece of legislation is the Water Framework Directive, which sets ecological water quality limits and the Urban Wastewater Directive, which has oversight over sewage treatment. So our governance, although it hasn't changed since 1989, is very much uh, being delivered through the framework of the European Union. Okay, next slide. The industry is massive. There's over 27 different companies, over 200,000 people. Uh, the water companies treat and pump more than 18 billion liters of water every day. We've got over almost 4,000 reservoirs over 300,000 kilometers of water mains, uh, and they're all there to deliver high quality water. However, drinking water, in terms of the um, household consumption, drinking water only accounts for about 4% of average use. The main uses of water in the household are toilet flushing, there's almost a third of the water, and this, bear in mind, is high quality water is flushed down the toilet, 25% is used for personal washing and 21% for, for clothes washing. 
So you're taking a very high quality water and perhaps using it for um, things that it shouldn't be used for. Right, let's move on to the next slide. So current issues uh, are about the control that private water, the private sector has over our water. People are starting to ask, uh, especially as some private sector companies are being sold uh, to foreign um, investors, people are starting to ask, you know, we're losing control of our water supply. Perhaps we should be renationalizing. Uh, and people are saying, Should, shouldn't, the, the, shouldn't the public sector have control of water? However, there are good arguments on both sides. A major argument for not renationalizing and not having the public sector involved is the fact that uh, the amount of investment required for infrastructure improvement is still massive and it's unlikely the government would put the kind of money in that's required. Um, there's also uh, issues about agriculture, agricultural pollution. The main polluter now of, of uh, environmental water, surface and groundwater bodies, is the agricultural sector with impacts coming from fertilizers, nitrate fertilizers and pesticides. Uh, and of course, the big unknown there at the bottom is what's, what's, in, what's climate change going to do? What's it going to mean for, um, for the water supply in this country? We've had droughts, we've had flooding. Uh, and that picture on the right gives you one example, uh, 1947 flood mark and the 2007 flood mark, which is significantly higher. Flooding may get worse before it, with climate change. Okay, next slide. Just a couple more points and then we'll hand over to uh, Evaristo. Um, the big argument about private versus public. Since 1990, the private sector has managed to invest 150 billion pounds into the water industry. That would never have happened if it had been a public, uh, in the public sector. There have been huge efficiency gains, largely from reduced leakage and improved management. But there are still major difficulties in terms of addressing conflicting government policies. For example, agriculture is a main polluter, but agriculture is heavily subsidized. How do we deal with that issue? It's not something the private sector can really deal with. And it's also very difficult for the private sector to deliver catchment scale management. In terms of the public side, um, the public, the arguments are that um, we are starting to reach the limit of cost effective end of pipe solutions. So there's going to be a need for impacting behavior uh, and changing the way we actually manage water. And that's something that would be more suited to the public. So this is a very live issue. Do we, do we manage water as a public good or as a, as a private good? All right, what's the next slide? All right, the final slide then. Um, the future, for the, for the immediate future, the water supply is likely to stay in the private sector purely because of the cost investment cost required in the infrastructure. Uh, there is interest now in things like natural flood management as a low cost alternative uh, and trying to solve problems at source through, for example, payment for ecosystem services schemes. The big unknown is what's the impact of climate change. Uh, and that's where we need to have some more uh, research really we're going to have droughts, we're going to have floods, we're going to have warmer, wetter winters, uh, possibly hotter, drier summers. That's going to have a big impact on our water supply and consumption. Right, I think next is, that's the final slide. I'll hand over to Evaristo in Ghana. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, I'll go on to my presentation from, uh, from Ghana. One of the I think your presentation was useful in that we get the perspective on uh, water resources from a uh, UK perspective. And we are trying to move uh, from the Ghana context to then try to look at uh, the issue of irrigation and how maybe the situations are different from what uh, uh, we have here in Ghana. And towards the end, I'll then uh, ask John maybe for the final slide where you give us an overview in terms of what are the issues emerging from, from uh, uh, from Ghana and, and UK uh, in the form of a comparison. All right. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of my presentation, uh, I think I'll just look at um, introduction and then I'll then also try to highlight the issue. Why do the commons matter 
especially in the context of developing countries. And then I also then look at the research findings from Ghana and beyond. And for this, I would also want to highlight that we are trying to draw experience from the wide uh, research that uh, the International Water Management Institute has conducted uh, in several developing countries. So although we are focusing on Ghana, but uh, I would also try to draw upon the experiences on those and say, what does it mean for management of commons, especially looking at the issue of irrigation. One of the, maybe as a preface to my presentation is also to mention the fact that uh, what we are looking at, uh, I think as we are marking the 50th anniversary of Hardin paper, which talks about the need for the state to take over the management of uh, natural resources. Uh, since the local citizens or the people could not be trusted, is the fact that irrigation is one example where that mentality still pers uh, seems to persist uh, in the sense that uh, we have the state still trying to take a major role in terms of decisions, in terms of uh, how uh, irrigation, uh, irrigation schemes are being managed within the developing countries. Uh, of course, I'm highlighting more specifically from, from Ghana. And maybe just as an introduction, I'll then talk about um, uh, what, why we need to see irrigation as a common issue rather than a technological issue. I'll, I've almost tried to paraphrase what um, uh, Hopi was saying within the context of forest, uh, where I, I've changed it to say that irrigation is not about canals, it is about people. And it is about canals, only as far as canals can save the needs of people. The argument that I'm making here is that common water resource management uh, should be targeting at equitable livelihood improvements. And what we should be focusing on is how can we better govern common pool resources in order to improve uh, equity within the developing, the context of the developing countries. This is uh, at the heart of uh, irrigation where in most cases it's being seen as a technological fix. And uh, in most cases it hasn't been sustainable because we have in most cases uh, tried to ignore the fact that it's a common issue, the collective issues, how can we better organize communities to better manage uh, irrigation schemes and uh, have uh, decisions in terms of uh, how we, it, it proceeds. So this is where I'm, I'm coming from in terms of how this connects with the whole debate on in terms of commons and what the International Association for the Study of Commons is pursuing in terms of uh, uh, having people deciding or making collective decisions and managing their own natural resources. Just a little bit uh, sort of a brief overview in terms of why this is relevant for Ghana. For Ghana, for instance, the current government has been talking about one village, one term. And uh, what they are promising under this uh, uh, campaign is that they are promising increased investments within irrigated agriculture. But what we also would want to know is that what are the lessons from the irrigated commons from Ghana and beyond that we can derive for? Uh, as the government pursues this one village, one day uh, uh, program, what is it that we have learned from the past? I think we have learned that uh, in most cases uh, that from what we learn from history is that uh, we don't seem to learn from history. So what is it that we can draw upon in terms of uh, uh, collective management? We have seen that uh, there's been quite a lot done, uh, not just in sub-Saharan Africa, but Ostrom yourself, I think she did even some work on irrigation including some work on Nepal on how we can improve commons management uh, and what, are, what is it that works and how. And uh, within uh, the region, this particular region, we have uh, maybe sayings from uh, Nigeria where they say that a child laughing at his father's crop failure is laughing at his own starvation. How can we, even as people who are in Ghana in urban areas, how can we better increase productivity within the uh, agricultural sector because they're also dependent on production, uh, which agricultural production coming from, uh, from the, uh, the rural areas. I'll then uh, go into uh, uh, some of the findings uh, uh, from the research that we have conducted in Ghana. Most of the work that we did in Ghana was conducted within the northern parts of, uh, northern parts of Ghana. But one of the key things that we have uh, found out is that history does matter. Uh, you had also, John, I think you were sort of uh, giving us a chronicle of what has happened within the UK. And within Ghana, that also matters in terms of understanding what has been the evolution of irrigation management. And within Ghana, we see that irrigation is grounded within social fabric. And we also see the importance of social capital 
if you are talking about collective um, action and uh, of managing irrigation, you need to understand the social relationships and how these determine how an irrigation scheme can be successful or not. And uh, it's one of the key things that uh, I think as we move into this uh, uh, One Village, One Dam uh, program, it needs to be taken into account. And uh, related to that is also the issue of formal perspective. We tend to see that, I think, uh, not just in Ghana, but in most of the developing countries, there is this modernization uh, agenda where they see that uh, in order to have anything progressive, you should be looking at uh, formal irrigation schemes. Anything which is informal is not knowledge. And uh, this has seen that we haven't been building upon the experiences that we have from uh, existing irrigation schemes. And uh, this also links to the issue of the what uh, maybe I think is the microcosm of knowledge creation. Whose irrigation knowledge is it? Uh, who is contributing towards uh, the management of irrigation? I think it's not just maybe in Ghana, but also in developing countries that we tend to look at modernization as taking frameworks and uh, knowledge systems from elsewhere as part of development and not building upon what is already existing, um, wow, existing on, the, on, on, the, on the ground. And we also seem to see that uh, almost going hand in hand with this uh, attempts undermine the traditional institutions. I think there's quite a lot of uh, work done on this on irrigation management across not just uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but in a number of uh, Latin America and uh, Asian countries as well, where there is a lot of uh, a wealth of knowledge in terms of how irrigation has been managed. Uh, but in most cases, most governments tend to downplay or undermine uh, the informal management uh, uh, institutions. And most of the formal institutions have struggled to establish themselves. And uh, this has been almost like uh, what I see as the double-headed nature of government policy uh, in most of the developing countries, where they want to have a modern government and at the same time maybe try to incorporate traditional leaders to give themselves legitimacy, but at the same time not incorporating any of uh, the management uh, attempts or, or past initiatives which has been in, in, uh, implemented by the traditional institutions. And then uh, what uh, in, within the Ashanti, I think in Ghana, they have a saying where they say a stranger is like uh, water running over the ground after a rainstorm, and they say it soon dries up. This has been the same case, I think, with, thin, uh, uh, with government interventions where they try to come and tell people what to do, but they are not on the ground all the time, and people go to their usual practice as before. And then in terms of one of the other things that we have also seen in terms of uh, uh, irrigation uh, management in Ghana is the issue of gender inclusion. We have seen increased feminization of agriculture, but how do we engage women, the youth? How do we address issues of land tenure where women do not seem to have uh, access, to, uh, access to land? And yet they are the ones who are actually in charge of uh, irrigated agriculture. And we also need to look at even the implementation uh, uh, even of partners, not just talking about government departments, but also the development partners who are involved in irrigation investment. How can these also become gender sensitive? And as we say that uh, gender charity begins at home, it has to start within our own organizations before we make, uh, we have gender inclusion within the irrigation schemes. And what we see is that uh, the businesses uh, unusual approach, this is what we should be going into where we are making changes. And if we take into the context that there's a lot of migration and women are now responsible for irrigation, but are we uh, equipping women and also seeing them as the farmers? We also see within Sub-Saharan Africa the impact of HIV and AIDS where by default women are becoming the household heads. How can we then incorporate this? What I'm saying with this in summary is that should, they shouldn't in nothing about women without uh, including the women uh, in decision making. And then so, also- so, Sorry, this yes. is Charlie. I'm just cutting in to let you know we've about five minutes left yes. for your talk, okay? Yes, okay. Uh, so I'll quickly do a, 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 a sort of a, a fly through the remaining slides. And uh, for gender, I've already highlighted gender, gender participation, men and women, women participating roles and responsibilities using the participatory approach, reconfiguring agricultural extension. 
uh, by making sure that gender does take into account that uh, women are farmers and serious farmers and they need uh, also to have access to capital and input as well. And then uh, I'm also, we need also need a participatory approach. Implementing partners must consult with women and men beyond fasciculation. And when I'm talking about fasciculation, this is what a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Alois Mandondo, talks about uh, uh, facilitated manipulation, where in most cases uh, there is no genuine dialogue between the farmers. So we need to involve the farmers in the needs assessment, decision making, and planning of uh, irrigation initiatives as well as in the implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of the irrigation of the irrigation project. We also need to address issues of equity. And uh, if you are talking about access, we need to address issues of distributional equity, where we go beyond the need bureaucrats to look at the social, economic, and political dimensions of irrigation. As I said, irrigation is not just technical. We also need to address the issues of elite capture in rural formulation. If you are talking about collective action, uh, managing the commons, it's about developing the rules and uh, who makes the rules, what's the role of the power dynamics in terms of those rules are uh, making. And we also need to address the issues of accountability, uh, issues of loss of funds. In Ghana, just that image shows where some of the schemes, they are actually having this board summarizing all the different indicators, how much has been spent on that particular scheme so that all people are up to date and uh, uh, we are holding the officials accountable. And we also need to address the issues of, uh, issues of uh, boundary and scale. If you look at irrigation boundary and scale incongruences, in most village boundaries, these are not matching to hydrological uh, maps or village boundaries. How do you bring the people into dialogue so that there's a common understanding on this? We also look at the uh, issue of informal water use associations that uh, how do you incorporate the informal water use associations and take into account their requirements or the informal irrigation schemes and build upon those rather than to try and ask them all to convert or get recognition and being registered as formal, where in some instances they lose some of their unique attributes. In, most, in Ghana and most of sub-Saharan Africa, the largest area under irrigation is under informal irrigation management. And, uh, some of the things that we also need to address is we I moved, I think, to the last two minutes is that the water user associations should be addressing the issues of water user association rules, regulations, local laws, which are necessary but not sufficient to access water legitimacy. Power seems to lie beyond the water user association and rule making processes. And then uh, we also need to address issues of conflict resolution and have nested institutions where you have the local being linked to the various uh, sub-national level up to the national level. We also need to address issues of rule enforcement and compliance, rule amendment uh, to conform to the changing circumstances. We also need to address issues of sustainability of the irrigation schemes and fund generation. One of the key things that we also see in terms of uh, irrigation is the need to go beyond uh, one particular sector and address irrigation in a holistic manner what FAO is calling Irrigation Plus, or within the International Water Management Institute, we are talking about the multiple use systems. How do you address the various water requirements of the communities, rather than just uh, on a top-down approach to say, we are the irrigation department, but we only focus uh, on uh, uh, crop irrigation only. And in the last seconds, I'll then uh, go on to conclude. Uh, uh, Charlie, I think I'm now coming to my conclusion uh, within the last uh, few seconds. In conclusion, I think I would uh, want to say that what we have seen in terms of management of irrigation is that water can and does defy gravity by flowing in the direction of power. It's not just about uh, 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 the physical aspects of water, but uh, we need to understand the power dynamics and how decisions are made in terms of collective decisions are made and how power does impact the collective decision making processes. And without such an understanding, we won't be able to have sustainable uh, irrigation schemes. And we need to address the issue of uh, gender within the irrigation activities, which will positively reflect in irrigation development outcomes. We also need to look at the political economy approach, which places rational decision making within the political context. We need to understand that technically and politically neutral irrigation schemes do not exist. Governance of irrigation uh, is the focal, uh, should be the focal issue. 
And we also need a suite of institutional options that we have rather than just having a binary, which uh, tends to cloud most of the academic discussions. I think we need to go beyond that and look at a suite of options uh, which are suitable for different contexts. And then the last point for my end would be that local ownership is key for sustainability within what I'm calling the watery commons in the sense that local ownership has to be uh, a key aspect in terms of decision. If you look at uh, even Ostrom's uh, institutional design, that's one of the key attributes that we need to uh, understand. And uh, that would be thank you from, uh, from Accra. Maybe just uh, uh, one or two uh, minutes for John to then uh, look, uh, summarize the last slide. John, uh, over to you on the last slide. Okay, ever so John, uh, we've got three minutes left before we end. So um, yeah. we have some questions, so anyway. Yeah, all right. Well, I, I, I almost like to get to the questions unless you have something. No, no, to that's all right. I'll, um, I, I'll, uh, I was just going to say, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I've seen the questions that have been asked here. There's several questions. Evaristo, have you seen these? Okay. I'll, well, I'll have let, it. John, John, let me, let me drive the questions. But well, do you want to say anything to close? No, no, it's all right. No, but what I'll do is, um, I was going to. How are you going to drive the questions? Okay. Go well. Go ahead and uh, pick up whatever question. Well, the first three, well, I was going to address the first three questions from Sylvia, first of all. Okay. Okay. Uh, and she asks, um, uh, on your th on the, about the theory of goods, does groundwater fall in the easy to exclude cell? Uh, and isn't it hard to keep people from extracting groundwater? Um, yes, I suppose that um, diagram I made was looking at how water is managed, currently managed in the UK. And uh, groundwater is treated as a private resource, a private good. Even, but anybody who wants to extract groundwater has to get a license. It's it's heavily regulated. So yes, um, if you're looking at if you're looking in general in general terms as groundwater, it is a common pool resource. So it probably would fit into the common pool resources quadrant. Uh, but the way it's managed in the UK is very much as a private good. Um, the next question was about what's going to happen under Brexit. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, we don't really know, but at the moment, nothing will change. Um, we will keep the same standards that are in the EU. Over time, of course, it's likely that those standards will alter and will probably diverge from the European Union. Uh, but hey, John, it's a lot, uh, lot sorry, to inter yeah, go on. sorry to interrupt, but we've got a minute left. And um, <laughs> could you answer the two questions at the bottom from Kofi? Kofi, me. Uh, is agriculture water also privatized? Um, what type of governance exists among farmers using water that keeps certain? Right, well, agriculture is very interesting right now in the UK. Yes, the water is privatized. All, all water consumption is regulated. You have to have a license to abstract water, whether you're a farmer, a household, or a big water company. So in that sense, it is privatized. Um, and of course, we have a doctrine. There was another question also about who decides what's, um, you know, what's, what's private and what's not. Well, we, we have a riparian rights doctrine in the UK. Uh, the legal, the legal um, status of water has been established for a long time. But of course, government legislation has changed the status uh, over time as well, from public to private. Um, but... Uh, Sorry, the interesting thing in, 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 is that the agriculture is becoming far more important as a both a polluter and a possible um, means of solving problems. Um, and it's interesting, I just picked up on what Evaristo said about the need to involve farmers and this idea of fecipulation, um, manipulation of people. We also need to involve farmers for new solutions to pollution problems and supply problems. So farmers and other stakeholders are now getting involved in natural flood management schemes, in other words, cheaper alternatives to reduce flooding and in, uh, in uh, ecosystem, payment for ecosystem services schemes. So we're actually coming back towards the situation that Ghana is in, in terms of we need to get people together at the local level, at the local watershed to sort out um, problems over pollution and problems over flooding. Okay, and so could John, I was, let me break. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Evaristo. Okay, yeah, yeah, just, uh, I'll just try to answer two 
key questions. The first one, uh, I think, was on the differences between um, uh, UK and Ghana in the sense that I seem to be talking about uh, not the canals, but the people. I think from our perspective, I think uh, development has to uh, uh, improve the wealth, well-being of people. I think it came from Sylvia. What we are saying is that uh, uh, canals are supposed to help people, not people saving canals. That's, that's the sort of the perspective that we are, we are coming from. And then the second uh, question actually came on the One Village, One Dam uh, uh, program. I think this came from Kofi. I think for Kofi, what we are saying, this is a government program, and there's been quite a number of resources which have been uh, allocated to that. And they are also requesting development partners to invest within this One Village, One Dam program. And uh, it's even going, it's even more complicated in that in some areas it's not, it doesn't have to be a dam, but investing in water infrastructure, sometimes it could be even using uh, underground water for irrigation. But it's much more, there's much more uh, sort of uh, uh, nuances in terms of that. But the issue is to provide more water for agricultural production. I think, Charlie, I, I can see we are already over time. So th those are the questions that I'll answer for now. <laughs> Okay, yeah. yes. Well, uh, uh, Charlie, can I just ask, is, is, there a, is there a means where we can respond by email to these questions in, 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 more, in more detail? Uh, um, I'll tell you what, put in chat, because uh, the, uh, the attendees can see chat. So if you open up your chat window, yeah. uh, type in your email addresses, and uh, the, the attendees, if they have further questions, can email you. How about that? That's good. Okay, that sounds good. So attendees, uh, you should have access to chat as well. Um, so John and Evaristo, go ahead. There's John's email. Okay. Uh, and just because uh, we have another webinar that's going to start up in about 10 minutes, and I have to get to moderating that, I'm sorry I have to cut it off. But um, let me say, uh, on behalf of the International Association of the Study of the Commons, and uh, in all the world Commons Week uh, organizers, we'd like to thank both the attendees and John and Evaristo for preparing and giving this really interesting seminar. It, it's fascinating to, to see these two um, contexts along the same prime meridian um, des described. And, and there's a lot of interesting questions in terms of comparative. Um, perhaps John and Evaristo, you, maybe you should think about if you're not already uh, putting a, a collaborative paper in for the IASC Peru, which for uh, attendees, I'd like to just remind everyone that um, in July 2019, IASC is holding its biennial uh, in-person conference in Lima, Peru, and the abstracts are now uh, due, uh, I believe, November 15th. Um, and secondly, and before that, in November of uh, next month, IASC is holding its first virtual conference. Uh, and if you go to worlds, co worldcommonsweek.org, at the top left corner, you'll see I, I, uh, little images with links, hyperlinks to both those events. So with that, I, again, let me thank the speakers. Um, since uh, attendees can't uh, have sound, I'm going to clap for them on behalf of the attendees. Yeah, and, could I just uh, say thank you, thank you to, for the please. questions. Uh, they're interesting. Set of much, questions. Yeah. I wish we had more time to respond, but certainly I'll respond by email if you send an email. Very good. So again, uh, the, the emails are in chat for any, anyone who wants to email them. And uh, at this point, I'm going to end the webinar and uh, have a good day at whatever time zone you're in. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Uh,